Hey, what's up? This is Jake here in Jake's shop. I'm gonna do a complete axle build video again. I did one about a year and a half ago. It's time to do another one, do a little better job. But we've got my 8.5 and my Cutlass. I've been wanting to put a better axle assembly in it, gearing, locker, you name it. I wanted to beef it up. Finally did it. Put an entire video, video together here for us to watch. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and break it up in parts because it's gonna be way too long for anyone to sit through, at least me, someone like me who won't sit still for more than five seconds, right? Break it up into parts here. We're going to talk about axle identification, kind of briefly, just more of the basics on some axle identification stuff, types of axles. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk about tools. When we talk about tools, we're going to talk about mostly the specialty tools. A lot of us guys will probably have tools that we have in our shop, tons of tools. We love tools. I love tools. There's some specialty tools you have to have if you're going to try to attempt an axle, and some you can kind of get by without. So we'll talk about tools. We're going to talk about the disassembly process of it as well. Taking it apart, there's a, the shims, if you've got an axle complete and you've got some shims in there, you're going to want to take it apart properly and kind of take some measurements, keeping track of bearing caps and things like that. Uh, we're going to talk about the pinion shims themselves. You know, if you're, you're rebuilding an axle, you've got the existing pinion, you can take that thing apart. Check those shim thicknesses because uh, ideally they're close, if not right on, to what you're going to need. But to do that, you're going to want to make yourself a pinion uh, setup bearing, which I show in this video. It makes it a lot easier to recheck your wear patterns when you're getting your shim thickness on your pinion. Then we're going to go ahead and talk about the carrier assembly. Putting the ring gear on the carrier is not as simple as it sounds. People like to make it look really easy. It's not all that easy uh, without a little bit of bacon. We'll get involved. You'll see that. Baking. You'll see that in a little while. Also the carrier preload on the carrier itself and checking your backlash, right? Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, the carrier preload. After that really, you know, after you've gotten it out of the car, you've done all your work, you put your axle back together, you throw it back in like it's really easy, right? I'm not going to go over putting it in the car and taking it out of the car, but we're going to talk about the final part of it as well. Did I talk about part selection? I don't know if I did. Anyways, there's a lot of parts. There's so many parts to these things, it's not even funny. Options with differentials types and gearing types, we'll talk a little bit about that. But really, also on that note, I chose Randy's Ring and Pinion, Randy's, or excuse me, Randy's Worldwide for this process, uh, Yukon Gears. They're great, they're great for us DIYers to be able to do and actually do this yourself or attempt to do this yourself. Wealth of knowledge. I've used them on my first build a couple years ago. I'm on my fifth axle now. I use them as a resource or a tool. You call them up, you ask a lot of questions, they get you on the right track. Say, hey, this is my engine, this is what I want it to do, this is the, my tire. They'll help you figure out what you need and figure out what kind of build you're going for, right? That's really key in this process. They, they basically allowed me, helped me over the phone build my first axle. Now I'm on my fifth, right? So I've used them, I've used their parts, hands down, just a great company to work with. After that, really, you're just gonna break in the axle after you put it in, right? There's gonna be a break-in procedure. Um, so yeah, hope you liked the video, we'll get on to it. Like I said, go feel free to fast forward to any of those parts that look like they might be something you know you want to see versus uh, other stuff. I, there's a lot of little tips and tricks throughout the entire video if you've never done one of these that I've learned now on my fifth one that's really helped me. So, on to the video. Okay, so what we've got here is a GM 10 volt axle. Now, most GM axles are going to be very similar. There's going to be a lot of things that are similar throughout this video if you decide to do your own axle versus the big difference on this one is it's a non C clip style axle. Uh, you're going to notice that by this big plate in here, right? And your bearings are actually held in, and the entire axle is held in with this plate. Uh, if you, when you open the differential up, um, you'll see that there's actually C clips on a C clip style axle. So they're slightly different. I have an older video that isn't as informative, but it did pretty does a pretty good job of kind of explaining that process. Now this is an 8.5 10 volt, and what 10 volts mean is there's 10 volts on the carrier itself. For example, this is the old carrier that was in that axle, and if you look, it has 10 bolts in it. I've removed a few, but that's a 10 bolt carrier. There's a lot of different types of 10 bolts. This is an 8.5, which is the larger of the 10 bolts in most of these setups, and you can really tell because it has this wing and this ear here, right? That means it's 8.5. It's a really solid axle assembly. You can really make these pretty beefy. The only downside is on an Oldsmobile and some of these BOP setups are gonna be probably have to go with a custom-made axle. All right, real quick, we'll go over a few of the tools that you're gonna need here. Some of these are gonna be specialty tools that you'll definitely need, and some of these you might be able to live without. 
This is a slide hammer. It's great for pulling seals on axles, especially if you got a C-clip style axle. This particular build, I wouldn't be using this because this is a non-C-clip build. Uh, this is a bolt type wheel puller. This I actually used to pull the old pinion yoke off. With those old yokes are kind of wedged in there and stuck in there. I used that to pull the old yoke out, made it much easier. I don't know how else you'd do that unless you made your own tool. This is a pinion bearing puller. They make cheaper version of this that you can use in your press. This is a nicer one that I actually borrowed from a friend to pull the old pinion bearing off so I could get to that shim pack and verify the existing shim depth. On that note, you're gonna need a press. I'll throw a picture up here, and this is just a, a Harbor Freight Special Press. I've actually had it for many, many years. It's, it, it works for what I've ever needed. Definitely gonna need a press. Standard torque wrench, foot pound torque wrench. That's just a 3 8 version. That'll be fine for this build. Um, you're gonna need a torque wrench. I'll throw the picture up here, a different type of torque wrench. I'll show the picture up here. This is an inch pound torque wrench that'll go ahead and do your uh, pinion bearing preload. You know, you need very, you need what, 10 to 12 pounds, I think it is off the top of my head, of pinion bearing preload, and you have to do an inch pound torque wrench. And this one I found online. Um, I actually borrowed one, and I have another one coming just for my own because I've lost my other one. And you're going to need adapters because it's a quarter inch drive adapter. So you need a quarter inch to three eighths and three eighths to half inch because you got a big socket on the end of your pinion. So you're going to need those adapters as well to adapt to this little teeny inch pound torque wrench, but it's the only way to get your pinion bearing preload proper. Other things you might need, now I went ahead and made a tool in the video, you'll see it as I come along. This is what I ended up using to pull the uh, axles out of this particular, because this is a press on style bearing on these axles. Various sockets are actually handy for many things. Now, use them to, I use them to press on bearings and, and actually beat in seals, or excuse me, races and different, and seals, different things like that. So various large sockets or piping is actually very handy in a build. You can get by without this tool, but it's really makes your life a lot easier if you just get one. I borrowed a, I actually had to borrow a race set tool later on in the video. You'll see it. It's like a $80 tool just for one size race on this particular build I borrowed, but I didn't have this tool. So this this works pretty well. I'm actually working on another axle right now and it saves a lot of hassle of trying to reuse an existing race and then tap it in there and get it square and get it all the way down and seated properly. This particular tool is used to measure your backlash dial indicator with a magnetic base. That's just a Harbor Freight special. You know, you're just trying to get your, your backlash figured out, something like that. So I had that for a little while now. Definitely gonna need one of those to properly check your backlash. There's really no other way to do it that I've ever seen anyways. Uh, good skipjack, sledgehammer, stuff like that. Definitely gonna need it in something like this, as well as solid shank screwdrivers. Use it for various things, beating out the old races out of the pinion and, and whatnot. A good set of dial calipers. Now, I've had a bunch of mechanical ones. This is my first digital pair. They had a great ratings online. You can spend 200 plus bucks on really nice ones. <laughs> these ones had great ratings. I actually a friend that has the set of these. They're 25 bucks. V-I-N-C-A, I don't know, but they are, they are notoriously accurate. I have not been able to screw these up yet, which is pretty, pretty amazing. You know, they, they zero out or close to zero out every time. You know, you're talking about five thousandths of an inch there. I mean, it's, it's right on. It's, it's just right there. And there's probably, they're dirty. I know I was using them to measure a dirty bolt. So anyways, those have been great. And you definitely have to have one of those to measure your shim packs as they're coming out of the axle and when they're going back in. The other thing you're gonna have to have right here is a good torque wrench or a good impact. You need a really good impact, half inch impact minimum. Good pneumatic one will work. This is a, a cordless one with a huge amount of torque. Every part of this build, you're gonna be using something like that. So like I said, some of the stuff you can get a buy with, some of the stuff you just can't. If you're gonna attempt a build like this, you're gonna have to have some of these specialty tools. Um, I would obviously have put the brake, uh, a brake tool up here as well for the drum brakes. You know, I didn't really go into removing the brakes on this axle. Next process is really deciding what parts to buy. And and it's an enigma, right? You, you definitely want to look at your axles and, you know, yeah, the car year and manufacturer and whatnot of the car, sure. But when you're dealing with old muscle cars, you never know. I mean, people change these suckers out. They've rebuilt them. Sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. Uh, this one's nice and clean now. Really what you're looking for is the identification on the housing that a lot of times tell you sometimes they're in different locations But most times they're on that uh, Front driver or passenger side But most of that, uh, you know, is going to be making phone calls talk with the guys that you're working with You're getting your parts from and they'll help you kind of figure all of that out, right? Because there's so many different types of stuff out there so that's what I did. I called Randy's Worldwide up and they've always done an excellent job of helping DIYers actually do it themselves. 
which is why I've had, had such good experience with them for the most part. So what I wanted in this axle was new gearing. That was key. The, the gearing that was in this thing was 256 gearing and this car did not deserve gearing like that. Also, what kind of differentials? There's actually a bunch of different types of differentials. You can run so, you know, completely open differentials, which is no good for a muscle car. You can run limited slip style differentials, a locker style differential. It's more of a locking mechanism that goes in there with springs. This is a patented design that uh, Yukon makes. We've also got torsion styles, like Eaton style axles. You've got spools. Depending on what you want to do, you know, those are decisions you have to make and really do a lot of different research on. Other than that, I went ahead and upgraded to a forged yoke, brand new gears. I went ahead and got a brand new cover, which also helps with strengthening. And I've got the ring and pinion there and the complete new kit for all new bearings, all new Timken bearings, good quality stuff, new seals, you name it. It's all part of the package there that I bought from them. I will go ahead and put links to the description down below on, a, on all the parts that I actually use for this particular build. If you happen to be doing an Oldsmobile in the 70 era, this should all pretty much apply. Now the one downside with an Oldsmobile, like I was saying, are, are axles. Now these axles were custom built by Dutchman. This is actually their stock replacement axles, they call them. They still build them. Um, and you have to give them, you know, to verify the exact, because there's different bearings in these end housings depending on the year of the car and assuming that you've got the stock axle under the car. So it's a bunch of stuff you wanna check before you go have a very expensive set of axles made. I wanna say these are at least 25% more uh, stronger than stock. And being that they're a 30 spline, they're even more, uh, they're even stronger than they would have been if they were a 28, which came in this housing initially. Those are some of the reasons why it's just really tricky with parts and why you wanna, you wanna talk with a, a good company uh, that deals in those parts to help you figure it out. The other thing I went ahead and did was the extended service plan. Now I know this is gonna sound like a bunch of BS, but if you're building your own axle and you don't mind getting greasy, Randy's has a very solid warranty process. For not much more money, you can actually get a lifetime warranty on these parts. Now lifetime meaning the time you own this axle. So like, let's say I set it up wrong. Let's say I screwed it up and it blows up the differential and the ring shot. That covers it. No questions asked warranty, right? No questions asked warranty on those parts. And that that's two different warranties. One's for the differential and one's for the ring gear. And the differential itself, if it actually causes damage, I think it's got like $2,000. in. So I think that's pretty cool. It's definitely something worth talking to Randy's about if you ever decide to go build your own axle. And that's why I really like it. Really like those guys. All right, time for disassembly. First thing I like to do is go ahead and take the diff cover off. I've already done that outside of camera just to drain the fluid out and take a peek at it. If this was a C-clip style axle, you'd want to go ahead and get in here and get the C-clips out of here ahead of time. There's actually a bolt that holds the center pin on this differential on a C-clip style axle and you need to remove that, pull the pin to get push the axles in and get the C-clips out. This is a completely different setup. This is a press-on style axle. So what, you're, what we're dealing with here, I'll show close up and then I'll show you what I'm gonna do to take it apart. But what we've got here is a press-on style axle. This plate right here needs to be unbolted. You can see there's holes in the axle to access those bolts through the end of the axle. And then that bearing is just pressed into place and this, this keeper right here is actually holding these bearings and this seal in place. Now there's a real trick to pulling this axle. I'll swing this around so we can see it a little bit better. But it's in there, it, 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 it's not gonna come out. Now we're a little bit closer, we can kind of see what we're dealing with over here. The only thing that's holding this axle in is that plate and that bearing. So you gotta remove those plates. Now I showed you the holes in the axles before, there they are. There's four of them, just. Now one thing I like to do before I'm tearing anything apart is I will soak everything in Kroll's or some sort of penetrant a few different times. Makes it a lot easier when you go to take something apart. Okay, don't wanna lose those because I do not believe I've got extra ones. All right, now the axle's actually stuck in there, right? The plate's loose. There's nothing, there shouldn't be anything really holding it. But, ooh, nice catch. But time. So rather than some weird special puller, which I know they make for these sorts of things, um, I'm not gonna bother with any of it. I'm gonna use a piece of fall thread. Keep it around for different occasions, <laughs> but this is just a half inch nut or three quarter inch nut and a strut nut. And what I'm gonna do is use it as a pulley, pull, or as a puller. So I'm gonna thread this in and all that's gonna do is gonna put pressure on the back plate and pull this axle back out at me. So once I get this to the right depth, all 
Okay. Just like that. Just like that. It doesn't take much, you know, you could probably wedge something in there, but it's just way quicker for me to do it this way. And that really just loosen the axle up. After that, it'll just slide right out. So we'll take a look at this side. And there it is. Voila. Okay, next part of disassembly, we've got the axles out. This is a differential. Now, this is something key in the entire build process and something I kind of want to keep note of the entire time. You can see the bearing caps on each side of the differential here and here. There's an arrow pointing out and an arrow pointing out. Those should go back in the exact same way we take them out. Fairly straightforward to take these off. You just unbolt these bolts, pop the caps off. Now, most times differential is pretty well wedged in there. You can kind of lightly tap it with a mallet and, and or stick a couple of pry bars in here to wedge it out. Since we've got this uh, on the camera here, I thought I'd show you one of the big reasons I'm changing the differential out is because it's an open differential. There's no springs, no clutches in here. It's not a locker or a posi or anything of the sort. It's just a full open differential. That's why it's going bye-bye. The next thing here is the gearing. Now, one way to, pretty straightforward on way to tell gearing, you can count all the teeth on the ring and divide that by the teeth on the pinion. If you can see back in there, you won't see it on the camera, uh, but the teeth back on the pinion. So to divide the teeth on this ring by the teeth in that ring and that's your gearing. There's an easier way too on GM cars. You don't have to bother counting and trying to keep track of which tooth you're on. If you actually just look, I'll zoom in and hopefully you can see it on the camera. I'll try and point it out. But there's two numbers. This is a stock GM ring and pinion, but it's 41 and then a dash, 41 dash one six. 41 divided by 16, that is 256 gearing. Uh, I'm jumping up to 373s, which will be perfect for this application. So these ring, this ring will look a lot different when it's done, and the pinion actually is a lot different as well. I'm not going to bother videotape showing this coming out. That's really all that it is. These two bolts on each side pop off. I'm going to keep track of the bearings. I'm also going to measure exactly what shim thickness is on each side. More of just a note, most likely it's going to be completely different. If you were going to reuse this setup, you definitely want to keep good, good measurements on these shims that come out of here. I'm not bothering with that. I'm not changing just changing gearing here. I'm actually redoing the whole differential, but I am going to note it and I'm going to keep these bearing caps on the right side. Okay, went ahead and got that differential out of there. It wasn't too bad. I went ahead and gave it a little love tap here on a couple different sides. Again, I'm not trying to save this differential. Loosened it up a little bit, got the pry bar behind it, and it, it popped right out. So it, this is a really good way to show you how this thing is actually put together. Now this was the shim that was on this side of the axle. And this is the shim on the other side. Obviously, I don't really need these anymore. Uh, these were machined at the right distance to make this all this gearing line up properly. So what happens is you can see when this is apart, these are the tricky shims, right? When you go to put this thing back together that you have to stack up and get perfect. Here's, your, here's the race that was in here before. And what it's doing is locating uh, the differential and uh, the gearing from the uh, ring to the pinion. So I'm gonna keep those kind of for reference. Now these again are the, are the bearing caps on each side. I'm gonna go ahead and use a grease pen and mark those, clean them up, set them off to the side. This being the uh, passenger side and the other being the driver's side. I'll mark them up. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing is here is here's your big old pinion. Now this is, this is the same thing as the ring. It actually has a stamp in here that you can hard, hard to see. I won't bother on the camera, but it says 1641. So that's the pinion for that ring. Now taking the pinion off, there's a, you know, how's this gonna come off? I don't really know. No, I'll show it. We'll flip it around and show you what I'm gonna do to take that off. Okay, I'm gonna try and get a good view here. This is the pinion, this is the opposite side. This is actually the pinion yoke. I've got a new yoke going on this one. I've got a brand new one here from Yukon. It's a forged pinion yoke, so that thing will be bulletproof. This is gonna be garbage. So to take this thing off, really all you need to do, first thing, is get that nut out of your way. Now this particular one is an inch and a quarter, so big ass torque wrenches are the right way to go. And I love these torque wrenches, but it's the only way, to, or excuse me, impact, it's the only way to get this thing off. And there's that beast. Now, unless something's wrong with this thing, there's no way that's gonna come off of there. You actually have to use a puller. I'm gonna go ahead and use a steering wheel puller because that's what I have and it works great. 
is center that thing right in there and pull this right off. I'm gonna go ahead and even use these bolts. Now again, I'm not trying to save this yoke. I've got a brand new one over here. So I'm not too worried about damaging it, but I am, I can reuse these bolts. A lot of this stuff stretches anyway, so you wouldn't want to reuse it. But there's actually, I don't know if you're gonna see it in the camera or not, but there is a little pilot hole in here, which for this puller will be perfect. And as long as I can get access to those, we'll be good. We'll get this set up here. I probably want to put a couple washers on it. There you go. Yokes off, and you know, this time the pinion slid right back too, so. Now, sometimes they can get wedged in there and you need to beat on them. Again, I'm not trying to save this, but you can see what the pinion's about now. We've got the crush sleeve here. That was on the old pinion. You've got your bearings all pressed into place and your shim pack is underneath here. This is the bearing that you're gonna wanna, it's a real tricky when we go to put it back together. There's actually some tricks. And that bearing looks like it got hot. So anyways, now she's pretty much apart. Next few things to do here is remove these seals and that race, I'll show you what's next. Okay, I'm gonna do the best I can to actually show this part of the setup here, or part of the disassembly, but this is a seal. Getting this seal out is not, it is usually pretty straightforward. The trick is not damaging the actual, uh, where the seal actually presses in. And usually, it will just pop right out. Now, if I was smarter, I'd probably put my jack stands and put some actual clamps in. Bearings right around in there. There we go. Old seal, gone. Here's the other half of the bearing for the pinion. Now, the only thing that's left to take out of here at this point are the two races that hold these bearings, right? There's a race on this side and there's a race on the back side. Okay, you're looking down inside where the pinion was located and it's kind of right there. I'll try to get a pointer. See that notch back there? There's a notch right there on this side and there's another notch right there. That's gonna be nearly impossible to see with the light at that side. And what I'm gonna do is use a solid steel shank screwdriver and I'm gonna beat on it till that race pops out that way. And that's the race that was on that side of the pinion, right? This race is back there. And then the same thing with this side um, for the smaller bearing on the front of the pinion. And what you do is basically the same thing. Looking at it from this side, there's a notch right there. You can see it better this side. I'm gonna tap that out there, another one on this side and knock that out right there. Then these two races are gone and out of the way. Okay, right, I'm gonna do the best I can to show you beating that race out of there. I went ahead and beat the front one out and it went pretty well. I like to use these little three, four pound skip jack sledges. Uh, I've got this thing on jack stands and they're not tied down so it's a little bit trickier but what I've got here is a solid steel shank screwdriver and it actually fits in those gaps perfectly. And just work it back and forth. So let's see how this works. It's actually moving already, so that's good. Put more downward force on it. Now the other thing I'm trying not to do is too much of an angle because there's an actually a machined edge on each side of these. And I don't want to scuff that up. I don't want to scar it. I'm just trying to get this race out. Now it's back away from it so I can get on it a little bit without having to be in those notches, but definitely trying to be careful. I just don't want to scar that edge. Oh yeah, she's almost out now. Just like that. Okay, I'm not gonna bother videoing the entire process, but I'm gonna show you I'm starting to clean this axle up now. That is all, I don't know, 30, 40 years worth of road grime coming off of there. You know, my initial pass, I'm really just using a scraper. I got my handy little scraper here. And that's just to get the big stuff off of it. 
You can see I'm actually gonna take the brake lines off. You know, the brake lines are usually pretty salvageable. The threads, you know, these are just all gummed up, but I'll hit them with the wire wheel and clean them up. They should work pretty good. I'm also gonna um, put some lubrication down inside them and, and spray them out and clean them. I've been spraying this end with Krolls where here and, and it hooks into the wheel cylinder. Been, I'm gonna replace the wheel cylinders. You know, when I did the disassembly component, I know I mentioned it earlier, but I'm, I didn't bother showing you how to take those drum brakes off of there. There's a plenty of information online how to do that. It's pretty straightforward, <clears throat> unless like these, someone went ahead and had the original drum brakes that were on it, and the drums were so worn from a previous brake install, it wore grooves into the side of the drum brakes, and they did not want to come off the new pads that were put on there. And there's it, a possibility that when I was 17 years old, I went and threw pads on it because I couldn't afford to turn the drums, but I don't know. I wouldn't put it past myself back then. <laughs> But anyway, so those took quite a bit of effort to get off of there. Uh, these plates will come right off. The backing plates will come right off now that the axle plates have been removed and all these these uh, keepers or nuts on this side will come out. I'll clean them up and I'll paint everything. So about 4,000 cans of uh, brake clean and degreaser and a lot of elbow grease. I'll show you what's up here next. Okay, I've got my cleaning crew in here. Say hi, Kaden. Hey, hi. Say hi, Nico. Hi. So we're cleaning up the back plates. Just really on this axle, that's what I want. I want to get this thing super clean before hand. There's a couple things that are kind of interesting when you clean something like this to this level. Uh, all the imperfections in the casting, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and clean up as well. Went ahead and used a little, little disc sander and just kind of cleaned up some of the little odds and ends in the casting. Just kind of make it a little better. Look this side, you can see this is an original weld. It looks like from the factory that isn't all that great. I'm gonna clean that up. Use a use one of those, get in there. Try and clean up that weld, maybe add a little weld to it. You know, this side they must have had the journeyman welder doing because there doesn't seem to be any imperfections there on those factory welds. It's really just this one. So little things here and there. Cleanup's coming along nicely, especially when I've got some help. I'm gonna use a brake clean on the final clean after I get done wire wheeling everything off. There's the uh, brake lines. Clean them up pretty well. I'm gonna go ahead and pre-paint everything and then kind of put it back together before I start assembly. But having everything clean is really important when you go and you're dealing with shims and trying to get this thing set up properly. You definitely, little pieces of dust can affect the shim thickness. So, on to the next step. Okay, so the very, one of the most important things is the shims in between this bearing and this main pinion. Now, most axle setups are done in a certain fashion to where they're, they're for the housing, right? The distance on this shim should be about perfect for this particular housing. There may be some variation there, but to start off, I want to take this bearing off of this pinion. There's a couple ways to do it. You can do it in your press. Harbor Freight makes a cheap type of pinion um, removal tool, a bearing tool that'll slide in between here and then you can press through it. This particular tool is a friend of mine's I'm borrowing and it's, it's a pinion or a pinion bearing separator as well, bearing separator, I guess they call them. I've never used this specific type before, but it's pretty slick. Uh, these just cup around the base of the bearings to allow you to pull it up. This actually, this piece of it will allow you to do that. We'll go ahead and try this thing out. Like I said, I've never used one of these before. So this will be kind of fun to, to try. Um, yeah, I really, really want to save the bearing as well on this particular one because I'm going to modify it slightly and use it as a pinion setup bearing. So we'll check, once this is pulled off, I'll show you what this does here, just like that. And hopefully my clamp method works. And there can be a decent amount of force on these, so. Man, I wish I had an impact for this. Okay, we're gonna try that again, and like I had said, I didn't have a, the right size impact. I don't have one inch impact, but I have the right size socket for this thing. So rather than screw around with clamps and that, I'm gonna try one more thing. Went ahead and grabbed a, a nut and bolt and ground it down to fit inside there. You know, worst case, I could actually weld this on here and it would be a socket that I could use for this. You notice I'm wearing safety glasses too, which, uh, for something like this, I've never done. Probably a good idea. So anyways, we'll see if this actually just spins it right out. Okay. This 
something like that. Yeah, I'm not gonna sit there and turn that wrench for that long. Being careful not to lose the shims. Bearing looks great. Like I said, I'll be reusing it. Now, I'm really interested to see, you know, in the, in the directions, it does give you a shim distance for uh, a stock setup. And it says point, oh, for a 8.5 in an Oldsmobile, it says typical OEM shim depth is 0 0.037. Let's see what it is. All these housings are different, you know, and I'd be really surprised if it's that. And like I said, whatever it ends up being, I'm gonna start with when I first put the pinion in and check my wear pattern. Definitely wanna clean anything off anytime you're taking a measurement this fine. You wanna go ahead and clean off the calipers, you know, you can be off by tenths and thousands of an inch. Point oh four. Zero, five. Go check it again. Ooh, 0 0.04. So it's close, but a little further. So I'm probably going to be somewhere around there. You know, 90% of the time you can run the same shim pack and you're probably going to be okay, but it's, it's always something good to check and it's not that hard to check. And if you don't check it, your wear patterns and then you end up being off, then it's a, it's a real bad day. I'm gonna reuse this bearing as well. So I'm gonna hone the inside of this bearing so that I don't have to press it on and off the new pinion to check it. The nice thing about reusing this particular bearing, it's a Timken, it's the exact same bearing that's in the rebuild kit I've got there from Randy's, and which is great. So rather than buy one, it's actually not that big of a deal to clean this up, take about 10 thousandths or so out of it, and, and then you don't have to press it on and off to check your, your shim thickness until you got you know what you like and then you press on your final your final bearing with the shims that fit properly. Okay, I'm gonna show you a little bit about what I'm doing again to, to reuse this old bearing and basically make my own setup bearing. So I've got a flapper on a quarter inch die grinder here and I'm just using it to basically clearance out the bearing slowly. It's taking a while. I'll show you a little bit about what it looks like. Try and get it on the camera. <laughs> So just doing that for, I don't know, 20 minutes straight, eventually it should be able to just slide right on the pinion. Oh, it's close, there we go. Yeah, it's, it's sliding right down on it now. So I'll probably take a leather a little bit out of there. Now, again, it probably wouldn't be so rough if I was reusing this pinion. I'll check it with the new pinion as well, and that'll be my setup bearing. Okay, brand new in the kit, we have a bunch of different things going on here. This is all from Yukon. This is how it comes packaged. Brand new, nice. I've got both pinion bearings. I've got my new carrier bearings. I've got my shim packs here, uh, new, new pinion seal, and my grade eight bolts for uh, attaching the ring gear to the carrier. So opening up the kit here, I need to get the races that are part of the pinion bearing. Now that's gonna be these two. Uh, these ones are actually for the carrier. So I'm gonna open this up here. We'll get the races out. Now one thing that's really key in this process is you need to clean these races. Even though they're brand new in the package, take them out. I use brake cleaner, wear a glove. I'll get them all cleaned up. The other part that's really tricky, it's not tricky, but you have to do, is clean up inside where the old race is where you knocked them out. Now, I know I did a lot of cleaning beforehand, but it doesn't matter. I didn't clean these enough. And what I like to use is just a little bit of emery cloth. This is a, a fine grit emery cloth. You can use green, whatever color. Get a glove and use some brake cleaner and really, really get that really clean inside Make sure there's no little pieces of metal where that race needs to sit on the back side. Okay, I'm gonna show why it's so important to clean these before you put these races in. Now, I'm hoping this will actually focus in. But what we've got here, that one I actually went ahead and scraped on pretty good. Here we go. You see around the edges where those gaps are where you knock the races out? There's a little teeny bit of metal. I just feel my fingertip of my, my, uh, my uh, fingernail. So I'm gonna reach in there with a little sanding disc on my quarter inch die grinder, right? I'm gonna get down in there and just touch those up just slightly. All that's really gonna do is prevent the race from sitting completely even and flush and you know along this back flange really nicely. The other one must have been in there like that before. 
I like the idea of those being completely compressed, so I'm just gonna barely touch it up and clean it. You can see I need a little more emery cloth and a little bit more cleaning right around that bottom corner with some brake clean. And so I've got that really clean. The other thing that's recommended is to go ahead and coat these things with oil or gear oil as you're assembling them. So I've got gear oil here. Just put a little dab on there. Coat the race with fresh gear oil. A little dab where it's going. Okay, I actually don't have, there is a separate tool that you can actually get that'll knock these in as well. This is for seals, so it's not as robust, but it'll actually work, especially to get it set. So the race goes in like this, and really the trick is just making sure it's nice and square, which is nice. That's why I have this. I use a three pound sledge. I'm gonna turn the axle up, but it's gonna sit right on the outer side of that race. Kind of knock it in square. I basically did the exact same thing to the back side. See, it's going in really nice and square, and it's just going to move little by little. Okay, after it's pretty much set, it's on the right track. I'm going to use the old race, and I'm going to put it. You know, there's a fat side and there's a skinny side, so it's not. It's probably out of camera, but I'm going to put this in like this. I'm going to use that to tap it. And with a three pound sledge, it doesn't take much. And it's moving really well. So, I've also got various sizes of sockets. Some guys will use uh, uh, pipes as well. This kind of helps get an even, even pressure around the outside of the race. And I can feel it moving. I'm not trying to go really fast. I don't want to wedge it in there the wrong way. Just kind of let friction and everything else be my friend. So that, and I can almost feel it when it bottoms out and stops. That is right there. All right, that's it. Races are set. I did the back one in the exact same method using the old race, you know, to make sure when those races match up, they're just perfectly even, and then you don't uh, have to worry about dinging it. Now, when I go to set the pinion, I'll do initial torque on it, and it'll, it'll, it might set them a little bit, but on inspection here, it looks like they're nice and completely tight to that back edge resting. Okay, some toys. Get to open some more boxes up. The next thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and set up the carrier. Now the carrier that I'm using obviously is a Grizzly locker. I'm not using the original carrier. This is the original carrier and the original ring gear that came out of the axle. Now there's two main shim packs, right? There's the shims that hold the differential itself, this way and that way, shimming each side of it. And then we've talked about the shims that are in between the pinion and the front pinion bearing or rear however you want to figure that. So we've, we've measured this pinion bearing. We're gonna start our initial setup with this pinion bearing. Now in the, in the rebuild kit, master rebuild kit from Yukon here, I've actually got the shim packs for the carrier itself. And then under this seal, this is the, the pinion seal, which we aren't gonna bother with at all. There's another set of shim packs for this. So I'm gonna grab shims, there's various sizes in there, and mic them and check them. You get as close as possible as 0.0405 that I can which was this shim right here on the initial setup. The new gears are in here. Now I went with a 373. These are spanking new. So same thing as with all of the parts in these kits. If you're using new parts like this, clean them up. They've got their initial coating on them. I don't know what it is, but uh, it definitely is something that's not gonna be what you want in the system. And it'll actually hinder you from proper setup in some ways. So. Here's my brand new pinion. There's the old one. You can see how much bigger that thing is, right? The shaft on that sucker. That's, a, that's capable of a lot more horsepower. So I'm gonna clean this up with emery cloth and some brake cleaner, and then I'm gonna use my pinion setup bearing, and it'll just barely slide over that. I'm gonna take a little more off of it just to make sure after I clean it, it might slide right on. 
I'm gonna use my pinion setup bearing initially with that dimension so I don't have to press on and off this bearing if this gear mesh doesn't work right the first time out, which I kind of doubt. I'm not expecting that at all. So before I can even play with that, I need to set up the new carrier and the new differential so I get to unbox a bunch of fun stuff. This is the part my wife loves because one of the tools in my toolbox happens to be in the house. It's my oven. This ring gear is not going to fit on the differential. Well, almost guaranteed. Even after I clean up, put a little emery cloth on it, check it. All right. Brand new GM 8.5. This is a Grizzly locker. This is the ultimate for locking uh, up your rear differential outside of welding it or putting a spool in. This actually allows uh, somewhat slip. There's a, a set of gears inside there that when one uh, tire breaks traction or slows down, it'll release. And when you put power to it, they lock back in. So there's no clutches, there's no springs in this setup. It is locked when it is locked. There's also a killer warranty. And I, as I mentioned before with the YES program, this thing's gonna be basically a lifetime uh, that I own the vehicle that I'll, I'll never have a problem with it. And if I do, it'll be completely replaced. But anyways, so here she is, brand new in the box. It weighs a ton. So this is a 30 spline uh, locker, upgraded, as I had stated earlier, upgraded from 28 to a 30 spline axle is coming from Dutchman. This is a beautiful billet piece. Uh, there's a lot of information on the side of the box with what that is. But anyway, there's the brand new diff locker. There's the open, fully open differential. You can see right there, the spider gear is just completely open. No springs, no clutches. This doesn't have springs or clutches either, actually. Well, I think it does have some sort of spring in there. That's above my pay grade. Anyways, here's the new ring, 373. Matches the pinion. And even, like I said, even after I clean it up, there is no way that that's gonna fit, right? There is a, a big old gap there. Uh, you know, some guys will actually take the bolts and run them in and then use the bolts to pull the gear down into place. You can do that a little bit, but I don't really recommend it. What I do is I put this gear in the oven. I'm gonna put the ring in the oven for maybe 45 minutes to an hour at about 250 or so. And I'm gonna put the differential in the freezer, cool it down a little bit. And that's after I've cleaned everything up. So we'll go ahead and do some baking and we'll slam that ring on. I'm not gonna bother showing that whole process, but that's how I'm going to assemble it. Wear gloves, it's hot when it comes out of there. Get the ring on first, and then we'll go on to the next step. Okay, like magic, just like that. I didn't bother videoing the whole thing, but the trick to getting the ring is really just that. Get it in the oven, heat it up about 250 or so for 45 minutes. It will drop right onto the differential, the ring. Um, you know, just, just put that ring in the oven and, and you gotta be fairly quick with it because that metal will already start to cool and start to shrink on you and you'll have to fight it. And you wanna make sure you have at least a couple bolts ready when that hot ring's coming out of the oven. Get her down on there and get a couple bolts in it to get it lined up real quick. You'll have to be wearing gloves, so it's a little tricky. Some guys will actually use the bolts to pull the ring down onto the differential. You run the risk of stripping the bolts out. That's a lot better way to do it and that's the way I've always done them. Next step in the process, we'll go over the press and I'll show you what's next. Okay, what we've got here is the carrier. I went ahead and pressed one of the bearings on. There's a bearing on each side, obviously, here. Only real tricks to this are getting, you know, I like sockets and pipes and different things for pressing. Uh, when I go to press this bearing on, I went ahead and found a cap, a gas pipe cap. I don't know, this is an inch and a half. I clearanced it out on the inside just to make sure it's gonna clear the hub on the differential as the bearing's getting pressed down. The other thing here is when you look at these bearings, you wanna make sure you're putting most of the pressure on the inside of the bearing. You don't want to pressure on the outside. So when I put this on here, there's clearance. You can see, I don't know if you're gonna see that in the camera or not, but it'll stay down out of the way, the outside of the bearing and I can get most of the pressure on that inside lip. And then clearancing that, the other trick is, so when you put these two together, you can see I've got complete clearance to where that'll press down and clear the outside of the hub. So we'll flip this around. There's not a whole lot to it. It doesn't take a ton of pressure either to do this. Um, you'll feel it when you're pushing, but see this, this bearing pretty much sits right on here. I did, like I had said earlier in the video, went ahead and cleaned all this stuff up. There's a light layer on there of uh, oil as well to help it. Let me see, where's my... So you can see, here's the center hub on the differential where this bearing will press down around it. I need to get this adjusted. 
and just press it right on. Only thing you're really trying to do is make sure it gets fully seated onto the differential. So you're just gonna watch the gap that happens right in here and just watch it close up and kind of pay attention to the, 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 the bearing as it's pressing on. Kind of feel it kind of just slide right down that shaft and slowly making sure my cap's centered here as well, the way it clearances the hub. But you'll see when we're done what this looks like. It's just a little bit of, like I said, I can just feel the press. It's just not taking a ton of pressure. Watching, I still got a hairline crack right there. She's on. Okay, so take that off. And you see the differential is actually proud of where the bearing sits, you know, checking the bearing, everything looks great. That's it, your carrier's basically now ready to go ahead and go into the housing. We'll check some shims and then start doing pinion depths. Okay, now that your carrier's pretty much set up, you've got the bearings on, it's time to go ahead and throw the pinion in. Now, the first time you throw the pinion, pinion in, you're gonna run your shim pack. Like I had stated earlier, the original shim on the original pinion was .0405. So that's what I'm gonna start out with for my initial check. What basically in your kit, you've got a couple different packs of shims that come in your rebuild kit. We've got the shim packs of different variations for the carrier, which we'll get into next. But first of all, there's a whole other shim pack in here, and that's the pinion shim pack. There is various sizing on all these shims. They have a huge range. I found three shims that equal the total distance of the original shim that was on the original pinion. I'm going to try to run that first to see where it lands. So like I said earlier, really, it's just put those on there. Go ahead and use my setup bearing. Setup bearing is going to be used so I don't have to press this on and off because I'm, I'm, it's very unlikely that I'll get the wear pattern I want, but it'll at least show me roughly what I'm going to need. Okay, go ahead and show a little bit better angle of what this is going to look like. I went ahead and got my new bearing in here, kind of lightly put it into place. I'm going to use the new yoke and I'm going to use the old pinion nut just initially. That way I don't stretch out the new one. It's a, I want to wait until my final assembly before I end up going and using that. I'm gonna go ahead and find that thing first. Okay, the first time putting this on, really, I'm just trying to get this torque down into place to where it doesn't wiggle back and forth. Okay, that'll be good for now, just for that initial check. On to the carrier. Okay, on to put into the carrier for the first time. So basically what I'm gonna do is take each shim, these are the original shims that held, held in the other differential. I'm gonna mic them, I'm gonna check them, right? So I'm gonna check both and keep track of which side is which, and then I'm probably gonna take about 10 thousandths off of it. So what we're gonna do, in the kit, they give you a ton of shims for the carrier. It's a two-piece shim. You see how it's got that rib on it? And then there's a thicker shim in there, and that's the opposite side. All you're gonna do is take these massive amount of shims here, they come in just hairline fractions to 10 thousandths, um, different, there's a ton of different measurements in there, and I'm gonna stack them up inside this ring first to what I want, put the cap in, mic it, and I want 10 thousandths less than this shim before I get done. I'm gonna put them in. Then I'll slide the carrier in. Again, I'm not checking backlash, I'm not checking anything. Backlash is basically how much that pinion or how much that differential can move before it starts to move the pinion, basically the gap between it. I'm not worried about the gap, I just need the fit to start so I can start checking the pinion distance, believe it or not. This is just the initial setup. So I'll get this in here with a little bit of play, I'll check my uh, shims, put the carrier in place, the differential in place, and we'll start looking at some wear patterns. Okay, like I said, I found the shims I liked for the most part. It, it went in and out a couple times just to test it, but so I took about 10 thousandths out of each of the original shims that were in here and then tried to get it in there. And when I initially put it in there, there was like no, it got in there, I was able to get it in there, but there was no backlash at all. So what I did is I shifted the pinion this way by taking about another 10 thousandths out of this side and adding another 10 thousandths to this side. Shifted it over just enough where I could slide it back in there again. And if you can hear it, there's just a teeny little bit of backlash in there. Right now I'm not adjusting for it, but I do want to kind of get it close-ish just for the initial setup. So we'll go ahead and bolt these bearing caps back on like I had said when I took it apart, make sure they're on the same side that they were before. We'll get these bolted in here. So I've got just still a little bit of backlash, which is perfect. So now it's really just time to check 
my wear to see how close is that shim pack on that pinion? What's my wear pattern really look like? So in the kit that they give you at Randy's Worldwide, you've got a little brush and you've got a little bit of uh, marking compound here. I don't know what the official name of it is actually. Paint. <laughs> now I'm marking both the drive and the coast side because that'll give me an idea of what's going on here. Got that pretty well marked up. I can already tell the pinion's too close. So you can see in the hair that this D pattern is starting to wear on the inside. That thing's bottoming out and it's just way too close. So I'm getting this sort of thing. And on the drive side, the drive side, you can't really see in the camera, but it's really starting to look like this. Way out here. So that means if the pinion's too close. So what I'm gonna do now is take it all back apart. I like the shims that I'm seeing right now uh, as far as the carrier shims. I'm, so I'm gonna make sure that those retain the same and kind of keep running with those. Pull the pinion out. I'm gonna take 10 thousandths out of it, do it again. Okay, I'm gonna show you what's going on here. I'm down now, the shim is so thin, it's 0 0.018. I do have a thinner shim than that, but there's gotta be something going on here. You can see, looking at the wear marks, that's way too, that's way too deep. That pinion's still showing that it's way too close and there's no way that it should be close with that small of a shim in there. So basically what I'm confirming now is that that race isn't set. Some guys will try and set races by torquing on that pinion nut and getting those two bearings to squish in hard enough to set races. That's not what you do. That'll destroy things. It's not the right way to do it. My hammer method was working for me, works for me sometimes, but I went ahead and I'm borrowing a tool from a friend here. I've got a, a tool that actually sets the race. These are different sizes for each type of race, and I'll show you how this thing works, because I'm gonna pull this back apart, and I'm gonna beat on that thing, and it'll tell me right away whether or not it moves. I'll show you. Okay, so again, this is the tool I'm gonna use to make sure that race is fully set. You know, when you're dealing with 20, 30 thousandths of an inch, if it's not fully set, it's gonna show it really improperly. So it is very important to get those races set the right way. Nice thing about something like this is you hit it with a hammer, it's gonna, it's gonna not damage the race and it's gonna make sure it's seated. And what should happen is if I hit this, once it kind of bounces back up at me a little bit, then I know that race is fully set. And it, it takes quite a bit of pressure. Now this fits perfectly inside there. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. See that? It's just bouncing right off. If that thing went down way more, <laughs> crap. So basically what that means is I'm going to start back over at the start. I'm going to go to 40 thousandths again on that pinion and we're going to see what it looks like because that moved quite a bit. A lot more than I thought. Okay, I went ahead and reset it up with 40 thousandths of an inch and I've got a really good gear pattern now on the differential. I'm going to go ahead and press the bearing on, the final bearing on. This hasn't been set up yet so I ended up with four different shims to get to 40 thousandths which is actually what came out of here. I'm gonna go ahead and press the bearing on the press. And really that's what's nice to have a couple pipes laying around. This pipe is a two inch pipe and it has to perfectly fit over the pinion and also press the bearing. And I wanna press on the inside of the bearing. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna press on the cage of the bearing. That way I've got complete pressure around the outside and I can still clear this because it's not gonna go on. Okay, went ahead and got that bearing pressed on the pinion. Now normally what you should probably do is put it back in without your crush sleeve and check your check your wear again, but I'm going on a little bit of faith here. I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be fine, save an extra step. Worst case scenario, it's not right after I put it together and I'll waste a crush sleeve. So crush sleeve, there's two ways to put a pinion in uh, for your final assembly after you've got your shims dialed in. You uh, can use a crush sleeve, which looks like one of these on the pinion. And what that does is when you're torquing down the pinion or the other side and the yoke onto the pinion, this keeps a little bit of tension between these two bearings. You want a certain amount of tension always there and uh, you don't want to over crush it. If you end up over crushing it, you're going to have a lot of problems. Uh, you won't keep your preload on the bearings properly. So I'm going to go ahead and try this for final assembly before I check my carrier again. And worst case, like I said, I'll, I'll destroy that. Okay, so if this is final assembly, which I hope, I'm going to go ahead and put the bearing in and I'm going to put the seal in as well. The only thing I'm gonna do for the seal is put a little bit of white lithium grease on the inside of the seal, and then I'm gonna light, tap that into place before I throw my yoke on and throw the pinion in. Okay, so my seal's in, the bearing's in here, just waiting for the pinion. 
I'm gonna go ahead and put the pinion in. I got my crush sleeve on. Uh, doesn't matter on this particular application which direction it goes. Okay, so a couple things. Before you put your pinion, or put your, uh, put your yoke on for the final time, you're gonna wanna make sure to use a lot of uh, Loctite on here. Now in this initial setup, I'm just barely trying to get that back and set again. This is where you can screw up, but see how the see how the yoke is moving back and forth? I know I have plenty of room before I'm even touching that crush sleeve. Okay, so like I was showing you, I was just kind of creeping up and making sure the pinion wasn't moving. Now the pinion's not moving, so now we're on the crush sleeve, right? And I still have I've been checking, um, I've got a little gauge here, this is an inch pound. It, you know, you can get these on Summit, there's a little KD tools situation here and I know I'm still a little bit I, I still don't have any pinion bearing preload obviously I don't have the carrier in or anything I'm trying to get my preload set on the bearing before I actually go into the next step here and test it so it doesn't take much so I'm just trying to creep up on it just a little bit and it doesn't take much all of a sudden you'll be there so you got to really keep checking it and checking it and creeping up on it little by little and checking. I'm looking for 10 to 12 inch pounds here, so. And right now, yeah, I'm not getting, I'm still not getting any real preload on this thing. So I, I keep doing it over and over again until I've got my preload set on that bearing. That's a very key measurement whenever you're doing this. So I'll get this thing set and I'll show you what it looks like afterwards. Just one more little hit and I think we're gonna be there. I'm already starting to feel tension. I'm just gonna barely, Again, I'm looking for 10 to 12 inch pounds here. Ah, oh, just another little hit. Oh yeah, we are. We are right there. I'm just gonna give it one more little. Yeah, I think that's gonna be it right there. Yep, there she is. There's my preload. I don't know if you're gonna see it in the camera, but I'm right at 12 inches as I'm moving. And that is how you set the pinion bearing preload. Okay, so the pinion bearing preload is actually, now it's all set up. I think I've got my right shim pack in there to get my good gear wear pattern. Now it's time to put the carrier back in. I've had this thing in and out a few different times to get it exactly where I liked it. Now, initially when I put it in there, as you're adjusting your pinion depth, you kind of have to shift it in and out because you want just a tad bit of backlash as you're checking your wear pattern. When it comes time for now, the final assembly, I need to get this thing dialed in. So we'll throw the carry in here and I'll show you what we're looking for. So there's the wear pattern I'm getting now. You can see the dark spots are right in the center of the tooth. So we know we've got the pinion shim depth correct. Now that the carrier's in place, I've, I've been taking the shims on each side in and out to get it going back and forth this direction. So what we're looking for is the, is the um, backlash. So what backlash is, it's the amount of kind of wiggle room you've got going on in there, right? So I've got a gauge set up here now. I've got it on the very end of the tooth of the ring gear here. And basically what you're looking for, I believe, is six to eight uh, on the dial here. And I think we've got it zoomed in here to where you can actually see it. And this is what I'm getting for backlash. So the angle doesn't do it too much justice, but she's about zeroed out. Maybe, yeah, she's slightly above. Get that to focus in maybe, maybe. No. So anyways, what I'm, get, what I'm getting is, is just about perfect. I think it's actually six to eight. So I'm running about eight right now, which I am okay with. It might change again a little bit because what we need to do now, I was able to get these shim packs into the differential without actually tapping them in place. Um, just a little bit of wiggle room. So I need to add just a little bit more shim in there because I want just a little bit of preload on the carrier itself before I do my final assembly. So now I'm pretty close, I'm pretty much there with my backlash. I'm gonna slide another 10 thousandths of an inch shim in there and luckily 
you've got paper shim, you know, paper thin shims in this rebuild pack here. This one's probably a .08. Uh, actually, there's two here. So yeah, th this is this is going to be a, probably a .008 or whatever, less than a ten thousandth of an inch. And I'm probably going to add maybe one to each side of the differential since I need to adjust my backlash to where it's not as deep. That means the ring should go this way. Maybe I'll just throw an eight, you know, point zero eight on this side. See where I'm at for backlash. If it tightens it up just a little bit, that'll be okay. If it tightens too much, it won't be okay. So really, that's what you're doing. If if you got too much backlash, then that means the ring gear is too far this direction. You need to come this direction. If you've got too little backlash, like you're not getting any, the ring gear needs to go this direction. So I'm gonna play with the backlash one last time. I'm gonna slide my shims in. We'll check it again. Okay, add about five thousand to each side. Now, obviously, this is the shim pack. I, I know I showed it earlier, but it's a two-piece shim pack here. Um, you've got the main side. This side sits against the axle, and you got the nice big flat side sits against the race on the carrier there. And then I've got my shims in between. I went ahead and cleaned these up real nice. Made sure you know even dust can be you know hundreds of thousands of an inches thick. So clean those up real nice, and now I'm getting ready to put them back in. One thing to kind of think about too is when you, when a differential actually sees power, it pushes this direction. It's pushing this direction, right? So you definitely want to make sure this these shim packs are tight because if it pushes too hard and it's able to get you know there's no preload on those bearings, it'll actually push the ring gear out of the way of the pinion and you're going to have major problems. Okay, so I can't push those with my hand, but I know if I just do a light little tap with a hammer and a brass uh, punch or a soft punch, she'll punch right in. We'll do that next. Now I'm right-handed, so this is gonna be hard to show. Now I'm being really careful not to hit the race of the bearing. Sounds like I have my backlash still, but we're gonna check that next. First I wanna put the bearing caps on. These actually get torqued as well. 60 foot pounds for the bearing caps. No Loctite. Okay, I'm looking for six to 10 thousandths on the dial indicator here. I've got her all set up. All the, I've got my shims preloaded. Everything is pretty much looking good. I've rechecked my wear patterns. They look good. And my backlash right now is sitting at 8. Almost 10. Slightly under. Somewhere between 8 and 9. So that is perfect. That is set up. That is ready to go. Okay, on to the axles. The axle is pretty straightforward on this one. This is a non-C-clip style axle. This is because it's going in my Oldsmobile. These are a press-on style axle. And because they're a press-on style axle, and I went ahead and upgraded the differentials. This is a 30 spline, these came stock with 28. I had to get pretty much what they call custom axles built. Now these axles are for Dutchman. They call these their, look at the difference in those. They call these their stock replacement axles. 25% stronger than stock, if not more. Uh, the nice thing about this is these axles come pre-set up and ready to go. Meaning on a non C-clip style axle, these bearings have to be pressed on, or put down the shaft and then a keeper pressed into place to hold them. The only tricky part about these is really getting, making sure all the dimensions are perfect. So when I contacted Dutchman, I had to send him a bunch of information, the, the depth from the face of the, um, where the wheel sits all the way to the top of the axle. Um, I had to give him the dimension from the bearings up and just kind of verify that this was definitely gonna fit this axle housing. All these housings are pretty much the same, but this is kind of what they, you know, what they look like when they're installed. This already has the keyhole in it, so you can get that bearing plate nice and sealed up. And like I was saying, there really isn't any trick to putting these in. Now that this is all done, the wheel bearing, the wheel studs are already pressed in, the backing plate, everything's just ready to go. Even the bearing's been pre-greased, which is nice. I'm gonna go ahead and clean the inside of this axle tube pretty well. A little bit of Scotch-Brite cloth here and, and just really make sure it's clean and do a light layer of lithium grease in there. 
And the only other thing I'm gonna do is I'll probably put a little bit of gear oil on that shaft so that just slides right in. A couple taps with a hammer really carefully to get it set and then I'll use the bearing plate to, to just snug that thing right up. Okay, went ahead and got the axle slid in, got them bolted in. No real problems there. The other thing, the last few parts of this, I, all I really need to do is put the cover on. I went ahead and opted for a billet uh, solid cover from Yukon here. This is actually adds structural rigidity to the entire case. What it also does is allow you really nice fill and uh, uh, drainage ports and a convenient location on the axle themselves. I also really like these particular drainage ports because they have built-in magnets in the back of them. But before I do that, I actually need to focus on the differential one last time. There's a, there's a pin in here, it has a keeper, and what that typically does is you could remove this out of the way out of this particular locker and you could bolt, use it to bolt your uh, C-clip axles back in, you know, to get the C-clips back in. Since this isn't a C-clip style axle, I didn't even need to remove it. But I actually do, because from the factory they expect you to be able to remove this so they don't put Loctite on it. So that's one thing they don't say in the directions, it's nowhere noted, but you have to remove this bolt uh, to gain access into here and get some Loctite on the bolt and then torque it back into place. After that, I'll put the cover on and we'll talk a little bit what the break-in procedures for this axle will be. All right, so wrapping up the axle build video now, we've got the axle installed in the car and really all that's left to talk about is the break-in procedures. Now, on a break-in procedures for most gears and differentials, what they basically recommend is not over 35 miles an hour at any one given time and you're going to want to do about 500 miles on your axle assembly. You know, stop and go traffic. You're, the idea is to let the gears heat up and cool down and heat up and cool down and that kind of gets all of the bluing and the different imperfections or in chemicals that are actually in the gear assembly wearing out, worn out, break in those seals, break in those bearings, and then change the fluid. You don't need to run any friction modifiers on an axle like this because this is a locking differential. There's no clutches, no springs. Oh, well, there's springs, again. Uh, no clutches or anything, so no friction modifiers, but you're going to want to change the fluid out. After that, you're ready to rock. So it's been actually very hard for me to drive this car without breaking the tires loose, which is a, uh, the main reason I did this build. Is it, These tires are just breaking themselves loose like crazy, having a lot of fun. I haven't even revved the en engine up much. So in the future, we'll go ahead and do a couple burnout videos on her, but first, I need to get her broken in. So hey, if you like this video at all, hit like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.